Today's episode of Poets at War is sponsored by the following. I'm Ian Wilson, and I create graphic art using primarily traditional methods, supplementing with digital where it's needed. I use a real pen, a real paper, a real graphite to make my art. I like to feel my art. I've always been this way. I love the feeling of a pen or pencil in my hand, the sound of graphite scratching paper, and I love the sight of a nice black line making its way across the page. So why choose traditional art over digital? Traditional art has an organic, natural quality that seems to be missing from most digital illustrations. The illustrated books and comics that were made in the days before digital have an excellence and staying power that is just as vibrant now as it was decades ago. These are the stories that stay with you. Dr. Seuss, Winnie the Pooh, Where the Wild Things Are. People still read these. I'm currently working on my own graphic novel series, Legend of the Swordbearer, and I've also had the privilege to draw graphics for two motion comic series, along with illustrations for a small magazine, Logos Sophia magazine, and various book covers. Don't let traditional art fade into the dust. Help me keep it alive. You won't regret it. Visit my website at ianthomaswilson.com for more info. This time on the show, we speak with author Abigail Falonga about fairy tales and their connections to our world, our hearts, and even the scripture. Join us in the trenches and get ready for more Poets at War! have kind of floated in the same circles on Facebook for quite a while. Yes, indeed. So, this Fellowship of Fairy Dust probably the first that we had interaction? Maybe there. Maybe um, the Realm Makers Consortium. I think you're part of there. I think you? I am. I don't do a lot with them, but yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, and then also, I have my two meme pages. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, dads that love telling stories and family memes and adventures and you uh pretty frequently react to those yeah even if i'm not actually following them or a member <laughs> <laughs> they just show up it's like yeah. okay well whatever they're yeah. funny <laughs> yep exactly so um yeah i've been uh, just because i've been so incredibly busy lately kind of just catching back up on uh what you do it seems you've been you've been writing for a while now yes i thought forever so. mm -hmm. and you're at least it's part of your stuff's published as from by a publisher yeah i've been publishing with um havoc publishing for a, a while now mm -hmm. i think it might be like three years which is like, wow wow it's been a while so that's wonderful yeah. are, now are you drawing some of those characters and things too are you are you uh yes no maybe kind of no i'm not brave enough to draw my characters <laughs> same <laughs> so yes it, it well i i do for myself and then i hand it off to ian because he's amazing <laughs> but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah so um yeah well I, i'm just i'm just interested by everything all the fox pictures oh, <laughs> all, yeah. of, all of the hedgehogs and things the the what what your stories are about you know i i kind of like getting into these conversations with people you've probably heard a few of them where i don't know that much about you and i don't do my research on purpose because i feel like hmm. it's more like i meet it's more authentic i'm meeting you in person you know to a certain extent yeah. and uh, like i'm meeting you in person and, and kind of just feeling yeah. things out seeing where they go i saw you were homeschooled i was homeschooled so we have that weirdness going on for us <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh yeah so i i guess i could introduce myself but you probably listen i know you've been listening to a few so i don't know how much you know about me but i could introduce myself if you want or you can and we can just go from there hmm. okay well um how about you go first and sure yeah well i uh i'm from georgia um i grew up around the atlanta area and i'm in augusta now um, I am a, uh, self-proclaimed bard. 
uh, and I do poetry and music and things of that nature. Um, but I do serial narrative poetry as my forte. Um, mm-hmm. So epic poetry and that sort of a thing. And cool. I, I both write and read and perform characters and do voice acting and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So narrative arts are really where it's at for me. Um, but in poetic form, I think that is partially due to my love of musicals and things of that nature mm-hmm. and all the things back, to, everything back to the most um pretentious Edda or Beowulf or whatever like everything in between all the way up to the cheapest Disney knockoff that's just that that's it for me you know storytelling and rhyme and meter and everything else so oh, yeah um that's really what I'm into so that's yeah. cool yeah so I see that you have a keyboard and a guitar do you I do. Play any do you play any other instruments studio style yes where I just pluck it out and fail a million times and then sequence it (laughs) Mm -hmm. um i do i am fairly proficient at tim whistle i have a um back Mm. over here there is a um the top of a cd spindle that i've screwed into the wall where i put all of my tin whistles so um i play uh all different all different kinds of uh whistles and uh, I think there's, you may not be able to see it from where the camera angle is, but I have a pan flute up there somewhere, you know, just other things oh, nice. of that nature. So um, I tend to be in that realm. I also have, I can move a little bit there. You can see right here, there is a MIDI bagpipe like thing so that I can play uh, electronically bagpipe music. So, um, oh, interesting. and the fingering is in the style of tin whistles so i didn't even have to Mm. learn another instrument (laughs) okay i was wondering about that i've always wanted to get into bagpiping Mm because bagpipes are cool they are cool but um (laughs) yeah (laughs) i feel like i could easily learn to play one because there's only a little bit of difference in the fingering um Mm -hmm. and then the uh the other thing is just the coordination of blowing and squeezing and Mm -hmm. or if you're doing Ilian, which is what I would really want to do, <laughs> you're doing chicken wings. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a, an interesting thing to watch. Just yes. watching bagpipers. Yes, absolutely. So, um, you want to introduce yourself? Okay. Well, I'm um I'm from New Mexico, mm-hmm. and grew up here my whole life. Was um, I've been telling stories my whole life. Um, and yeah, starting from when my mom assigned me a random story to uh, to write a a story based on a picture that I drew, mm-hmm. she's like, "Write a story." So I did, and it got really long. So, <laughs> and it's like ever since then, I've loved writing and um, expanding different universes. I've always loved telling stories that are fairy tales. The form of the fairy tale fascinates me and I love to to apply it to different genres. Mm-hmm. So my primary genre at the moment is fairy tale retellings. So I have one book out, self-published, which is retelling the, uh, the 12 Dancing Princesses. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I'm working on another one, which is going to be a combination of uh, Snow Queen plus elements of Peter Pan, Ooh. a little bit of um, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and yeah, it's it's awesome. I really like the project, but yeah, it's interesting that you brought that. That's your thing, and that you brought those up. I've been slowly getting back into my writing process because I've been doing so much um, online performing. You've seen some of the short videos, the the poems, mm-hmm. and everything, and just trying to get that moving. Cause that's what gets, that seems to be the big thing that gets traction. Um, I was working on writing one of my retellings um, of oh, yeah. Thumbelina. Um, I'm doing an epic 50 poem uh, Thumbelina. Um, so lyrical poem. So they're like about as long as a song. So about 50 of them mm-hmm. um, to give you an idea of the length. And um, I was, I think you read some of the stuff that I was asking in the brood. You're, you're one of the few that has been on here that was 
in the brood, but it wasn't like in my first line of people that I did the podcast with, you know what I mean? So it's kind of cool that I can mention the brood and you know exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, so it's, it's, it's exciting to hear uh, retellings, especially when people can either go deeper or or develop the characters deeper, or really, I think one of my favorite things, especially when I when I do it in, in, in poetry is um, taking the emotion of a fairy tale and putting it to lyric. Mm. Uh, that's one of those things that they just marry so amazingly well. And everyone knows it. It's like saying that steak and butter or peanut butter and jelly go really well together, right? Like it's, it's just a really standard flavor, mm-hmm. but I feel like it's timeless. People just never get, never get sick of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the um, that's a really, that's a fun idea doing a lyrical retelling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, with my, with um the fairy tale retellings that I've been doing, especially with the book that I did, mm-hmm. it's um which I suppose I should pull it out and say, yes, please, plug that book <laughs> all you want, girl. Yeah, <laughs> it's a time of mourning and dancing, and it's a little longer than a novella. It's not that long. Um, but what I had fun doing was um, exploring the story in more depth. Mm. So it's a lot of people have been commenting that it's basically an expansion of the story that's already there, exploring the different characters. The main character is the soldier who um, gets roped into investigating what the princesses are hiding and then exploring why the princesses are hiding the secret of dancing. And it's so important to them that they have caused the death of a string of previous princes and soldiers. And like, why, why is it that important to them? Right. So I had so much fun exploring that and getting into it. And I, I, well, I think I'm pleased with how it turned out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's <laughs> good enough. Oh, hello, sunshine. Hello, sunshine. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> For those listening and not watching, uh, the New Mexico sun is uh, getting low in the West, I believe. So, mm-hmm. um, coming right through the window. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, uh, but yeah, that, that's, that's fascinating. Um, one of the first one I did um, was uh, The Little Mermaid. And I knew I could do it fairly, fairly quickly. And, and I, I was, I have a lot of opinions about the little mermaid <laughs> and both the Hans Christian Anderson and the Disney, cause they're so different and everything else. And I feel like in many ways, Hans didn't miss the point. Obviously he created it, but he mm-hmm. under emphasizes the point of the story I find. Hmm. And I think that Disney, of course, missed it completely. You know. Oh yeah. Um, it, it's one of their worst uh, fairy tales that they've ever done, as far as an adaptation goes. Yeah, it's terrible. I just <laughs> yeah. watched it for the first time <laughs> last year, and it's like, wow, that's awful. Now, 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 I will say they got Ariel as a character down really well, mm-hmm. and even though her motivations are all messed up for the story. She herself is fantastic. Jody Benson, the animation, mm-hmm. the, the everything about it is it, it's an extremely beautiful movie. It's just the morals are so skewed that it just ruins everything. And the ending is just spit in the face of everything that's, you know, dark fairy tale. Mm-hmm. Um, but to me, it was never a dark fairy tale either. You know, I mean, a lot of people look at it that way. That's what it is on the surface. But um, talking to someone who loves fairy tales, uh, I think that the point that Hans makes about the mermaid going to heaven is compared to his other works, very undersold. Because <laughs> some of his other stories, like Little Match Girl, which is a very comparable in the ending. Um, it, well, I mean, he really like lays it on thick in the Little Match Girl, right? And I don't mean to make you cry right now. (laughs) (laughs) I will cry. That one always makes me cry. Oh, it's so good. It really is. But like, so I I wanted to take that, the point that the mermaid goes to heaven and the fact that I think that he, 
because he's doing fairy tale in a more traditional sense, he doesn't really get into the desire. And I think that's something Disney actually did well, especially with part of your world. The lyrics to part of your world are fantastic. You know, um, the, the especially um, what's a fire and why does it, what's the word burn? Like mm-hmm. that's th- like that sort of yearning and longing is somewhat missing from Hans's motivation for his mermaid um and the intensity of it you know but you don't feel any of that l- lack of intensity with ariel you know it's like it's like girl tone it down <laughs> you know yeah. but but yeah i just i really wanted to take it and tell it fairly straightforward have the creepiest um sea witch you could possibly have like really like actual like horror scary and then do what the little match girl did <laughs> <laughs> in mermaid form and really just kind of show the beauty of what Hans already had there but mm-hmm. yeah I'm saying Hans like I know him oh yeah <laughs> your buddies yeah we kind of are in a way at least on my <laughs> side of things <laughs> but, it's his yeah. own fault for being for dying too early right he well the fact is I'm I'm obsessed with his story, his own personal Mm -hmm. story too. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of people haven't read his autobiography. Didn't some? A lot of people don't know he even wrote one. Um, And there's a a sort of conspiracy theory, history channel style documentary that I found on DVD on a website somewhere and saw really good reviews. But like they only sell it on DVD, like DVD are burned and send it to you in the mail. about his life and the whole premise of their argument is that he was actually bastarded royalty and that was the um and he found out later in life and Hmm. that was the impetus for the ugly duckling oh interesting idea yeah and they they have some really good evidence to back it up you know of course it's still kind of history channel conspiracy theory whatever and Mm -hmm. could totally not be true but the fact that the biggest the biggest linchpin in the argument was basically he gets this patron absolutely out of nowhere that basically takes care of him his whole life and it's like this prince of denmark kind of thing you know and it's like why in the world would that happen this guy wasn't like the big big patron of the arts he just finds this obscure children's writer and failed opera singer that blew his voice out and is like oh yeah i'll take care of you the rest of Hmm. your life (laughs) so yeah but anyway i don't know (laughs) yeah he's an interesting writer i haven't um i haven't read everything of his but um i don't know i've been well obviously i'm working on a snow queen retelling that story is amazing yes it is i mean you know speaking as somebody who's loved fairy tales my whole life um i haven't actually read that many Mm -hmm. until recently yeah it's just the form that um is most natural to me so i'm discovering these stories like the snow queen which is incredible Mm -hmm. and it's yeah it's very interesting to have the um to analyze these stories and how they're put together and and like the marsh king's daughter that's another one that's really fabulous Mm -hmm. and i haven't read that much about his history except for like the little snippets that they have like at the beginning of books Mm -hmm. so it's and of course that's not enough interesting writer yeah yeah do you have a um obviously there's a lot of unknown fairy tales but they come from a certain region and have a certain flavor to them that Mm. sort of a thing is have you found yet that you have a favorite either region slash time period or author in the fairy tale genre you know classical fairy tale genre that really sticks out to you Hans is one of the big ones for me even though he's kind of late in the game yeah (laughs) um but going even later like George MacDonald oh yeah he's definitely a favorite but you know yeah he 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 can get weird but i really like him he's he's a he's a fascinating guy and he and hans both um they both were universalists in the sense that they could not imagine god sending anyone to hell yeah and that was that's an interesting thing that led to some very interesting ideas in their work yeah it makes some of the stories have an interesting twist 
still enjoyable mm-hmm. but um yeah so with the yeah. um yeah it's uh so regionally speaking some of my favorite fairy tales are probably more of the um I don't know. I really like the um, like the Arabian Nights style fairy tales. Yeah, it's interesting. Those are really a nice format. Are you talking about the 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 uh, the the framing story with Shahrazad? Uh, well, I love Shahrazad, but um, no, I mean like the um, just that region, that that kind of story. Yeah. It does. It's a good form. Yeah, and um, yeah, but mostly just good old classic grim and. Grim Brothers, Grim Brothers Incorporated, yeah, producing fairy tales to United Kingdom. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, there was a there's a um, storyteller. He does audio storytelling and some audio audiobook readings and things, kind of like I do. Um, but he was he's been around a long time. You might know him because of the homeschool community. Jim Weiss. Does that sound familiar or no? Vaguely familiar. Vaguely I'm familiar. Sure. Yeah. yeah, he's been around since the, the late 80s, I believe, um, doing stuff. And he's um, he's really cool. He was kind of a mentor to me in my late teens, early 20s for storytelling and things of that nature. And um, he's still doing a thing, a few things here and there. But he actually has an album where he kind of took the Jadazad story, the, the framing story anyway. And it's it's kind of funny how, how he did it because it's not like just a, like a beginning and end. It has the, the middle, you know, interludes mm, yeah. like, like Shahadazad, but he took a bunch of disparate Celtic stories and tied them together with the idea that uh, an old Druid who's on his last legs in his last few years of life is going on a walk with Patrick and some of his buddies t- in order to tell them these stories so they can write them down and preserve them. Hmm. And Oh, some of Patrick's buddies are like, like, get to the point already. We need to write this down. <laughs> Daylight's going, you know? And, and Patrick's like, no, just let him tell the story. And he's like, yeah, what's wrong with you guys? It's like, <laughs> stop rushing me, you know? But it's it, it some, it some really good stuff. And I'm a huge, I mean, I don't know anyone who actually knows any Celtic mythology that doesn't love it. Mm. It's It's so disparate and foreign and... To, and anything that's Gaelic that's you know of the Gauls mm. it was so utterly different and foreign from anything that came through the Frankish Empire and you know everything that came around from, from that period to what we think of as most of Western Europe now um, it's yeah. so different and so strange and so bizarre at times yeah. Um it's, Even yeah. from like Norse mythology and yeah. Norse stories, it's Norse just, it is a little own... bit closer to us because yeah. the Vikings conquered people and you know whatever. Mm-hmm. But like, yeah, but... yeah. Once one thing that's really interesting, um, as far as folklore goes, is that I found the same story but like with different twists. Yes. In a, um, a I can't pull it up off the top of my head. So um, in a book of Irish folk stories mm-hmm. and in a book of New Mexican folk stories where I'm yep. from. Yep. And it's so cool because you're like, oh, wow. So, I mean, it's interesting because um, Mexico had a lot of Irish immigrants. Mm-hmm. So they brought these stories in and different flavor. Oh, yeah. The Irish version is playful. Mm-hmm. The Mexican version is really dark. Yeah. It's so fascinating to yeah, see how that works. There's so much Scots Irish heritage in particular in the South, where I well, I mean you're oh, South, yeah. but you know what I mean. When yeah. I say South, I mean Southeast. But most yeah. people know that. But um, the the uh, the thing with the Scots Irish heritage um, and everything, particularly in the coastal uh, Southern states, the Carolinas and Georgia and um, some of North Florida and and then up into the mountains into Tennessee and you know yeah. Kentucky and all that um the Appalachian you know yeah. stuff uh it's a lot of people don't know and this is really crazy stuff and yeah there's folklore to it and there's things to be questioned but um one 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 example uh there is a um there are multiple European ruins 
in the European style ruins uh, in the uh, Appalachian uh, mountains of castles, basically like ruins mm. of castles. And there is proof. Now this is actual proof during the around 1100s or so there were Welsh people, I believe it was 1100s Welsh people that migrated in um, when they were driven out by the Saxons and all kinds of other stuff going on. And so there were actual Welsh settlements. And that's one of the reasons why, um rogers is one of the most common cherokee surnames hmm. um and uh I, I, there's other ones like murdoch and maddock and maddox and things of that nature um but then also uh west virginia um there is a cave and it's one of these things that's on private land and they don't really let people back there very often um they have uh, high, almost hieroglyphic style carvings in it and for centuries people thought it was just you know whatever old Native American tribe and it's not fully been confirmed by any stretch but there's a um, amateur hobbyist but he's a learned guy he's like a uh, uh, not just a dentist but like the next level academically you know of, of dentist and so he he knows something and he's a hobbyist when it comes to gaelic and things of that nature and sort of a renaissance man and he went in and he said he believes that the uh christmas story is actually written in gaelic on the walls whoa and if that is the case the obvious answer would be saint brendan during the time of Patrick and everything else sailing over on his coracle, you know, to the Cherokee and preaching to them because there's records of him doing such a thing. It's huh. We just don't know where he landed. He talked to some natives, he came back, whatever, right? <laughs> and so the other thing is, um, and this is, I've, I've heard differing thoughts on this, uh, whether it happened or didn't, but apparently this guy, this dentist guy, supposedly came back on Christmas and looked and there was light shining through slits in the rock oh. illuminating the text and that's totally like <laughs> indicative of hmm. very early irish uh you know architecture ideas you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so um take that for what you will you can research it and find out there's very few pages that talk about it on the internet but if you look it up far enough you'll find it but yeah it's like we sit here and we act like the dark ages were really dark <laughs> they weren't yeah. at all no. everybody talked with everybody as just as they always have all over the world there were always yeah. merchants trying to go a little further trying to see if they could sell mm -hmm. their wares making ties making connections it's just that we have such a uh the, the the people who wrote history for so long and to a certain extent still do with public schools and things of that nature they they uh completely Eurocentric, uh, they 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 take, they centralize it European style. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. everything is, basically, if it didn't happen from the Frankish Empire, like it didn't really yeah. exist. You know what I mean? So, but yeah, looking at other perspectives might give you a different idea. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Middle Ages were not so backwards as you think. Yeah, yeah, no kidding, no <laughs> kidding. And like, even with, and I, I'm not going to go too, too thoroughly deep into this because, you know, whatever controversy, this, that, or the other, but my uh, pastor had friends, uh, he is, he is 75 ish around there. I'm not my pastor currently, my pastor that I grew up with right back, back, back home. Um, he's still preaching and he um, is just a, remarkable man and he actually knew some people when he was a young man um who were slaves during the civil war who were white slaves mm. and um their whole situation uh financially uh, they told them stories about how their 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 financial situation particularly because they weren't black <laughs> how how quickly they were just dropped by society and how they were just, you know, basically told to fend for themselves and what was a, a minor famine, you know, during the time in their particular area, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And wow. um, yeah, it was <laughs> like, people don't talk about that kind of stuff, you know? Um, yeah. It's 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 so, so crazy. And yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. The people who fall through the cracks. Yeah, no there's kidding. a lot of that. Mm -hmm. 
I just got an idea for a new book. Mm -hmm. Now, sorry, I was just thinking about the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. And specifically, the Dark Ages refers to that time, you know, when after the fall of the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. when everything sort of collapsed. That's post-apocalyptic. Oh, it is. That would be so cool, like doing a post-apocalyptic book and then having it sort of suddenly emerge as an Arthurian retelling. Yeah. That could be cool. And, and you know, another another place that's a really amazing apocalypse, way better than the one we're having now. <laughs> like way, way, <laughs> way better, just saying. Because I mean, we're, we're talking thousands of miles away from one another and people act like, you know, we're the whole world's going to hell in a handbasket because of it. And I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm post-millennial. I believe things are ultimately getting better no matter what collapses but um that's just something i believe is it taught in the bible we can get into that if you want but the point that i'm trying to make is um the fall of the holy land uh it, during the frankish empire you know leading up to what the black plague hmm. like nobody thinks about that you basically had the holy land as our ver like their version of florida to us you know what i'm saying it was the, it was the big tourist yeah. destination that everyone would go to that's why the templars were created to create safe roads that people could yeah. go have their vacations have their pilgrimages right and then they lost that they lost all of the money and all of the trade and everything else that came with it and the you know hundreds of men and the entire culture of european mixed with arab people you know, basically either moved north into the Baltic or disappeared altogether. And then you have the, like the black plague on the heels of all of that and mm -hmm. everything just collapsing. And I'm sitting here going, Christendom was dead. Yeah. And God resurrected it. Imagine that he's pretty good at resurrecting things. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Working through his church. Yeah, exactly. No matter what weird things the church does exactly no matter <laughs> how much it like, splinters yeah he draws with the crooked sticks <laughs> mm -hmm. and oh, makes boy. yeah and makes his will known yep yeah but i tell you what it's it's oh that's that's just one of those things that you know i was researching because i'm writing a story during that period and um mm -hmm tying it into my superhero world of all things uh eh, years and years later but you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly you know how this goes <laughs> i was looking on your on your page and i saw that you were talking about beauty and the beast are you still writing that or is that finished or where are we at yes i'm working on my beauty and the beast story and um uh, it's for an anthology it's going to mm -hmm. probably be over ten thousand words so it's not the longest mm -hmm. but yeah so that's going to be fun. It's yeah. a, um, I already have a, the beginning. It's a combination Snow White, hmm. Little Red Riding Hood, Beauty and the Beast hmm. retelling. Fascinating. So, kind of beginning with Snow White and the, um, her stepmother, who I wrote her story. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love her character. She's one of my favorites. So, anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, so she sends her stepdaughter off, and her stepdaughter encounters wolves. Mm -hmm. So you have the uh, Little Red Riding Hood element going on. Yeah. And she takes refuge in, well, I forgot, there is a Goldilocks element. Yeah, so she takes refuge in a castle, and it turns out the castle is inhabited by vampires. Ooh. And so it turns into this Beauty and the Beast, except that, yeah, so... Yeah, and then a little bit, um, the um, the huntsman who is sent to pursue her and who slays the uh, wolves, like in Little Red Riding Hood. Mm -hmm. And he turns out to be involved in the Beauty and the Beast aspect. And that's going to be fun. That does sound fun. Yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to be doing Beauty and the Beast after Thumbelina, but I probably going to be doing twice that like a hundred epic novel a <laughs> hundred yeah. lyric epic novel um but basically like that's my second well the 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 original disney film is my second favorite standalone movie of all time mm. right behind it is really yeah, good yeah it is well you think of someone who loves lyrics like 
that's oh. Howard Ashman's. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. his 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 literal and absolute swan song. It's just I know he did a little bit on Aladdin before he died, but like the the his his lyrical work in Beauty and the Beast was impeccable. Um, mm-hmm. But the uh, that one's intimidating to me because I love the story so much. Yeah. And it's not, and I'm really trying hard not to do the standard French story nor the Disney story because there are so many variations. Yeah. There's the, the one that I'm pulling from the most is actually the Irish variation that is actually gender swap to a certain extent. Um, Arian Rod, you know about Arian Rod or no? Um, not off the top of my head. Okay, well, but... ba- basic story. Um, uh, and and people could be interested in this particularly because it's it's a Beauty and the Beast sort of story, but it's mm-hmm. it's gender swapped. It's it's Irish thing. It's all really cool stuff. But basically, you have um, I believe it's two brothers. There's obviously variations. You know, it's because it's such an old story. But they go into the woods and um, they're hunting, and they come across uh, this knight that go- starts attacking them. One of the brothers is trying to protect and call out and thinks this guy's just hunting and he's generally just being kind about the whole thing. And his brother just immediately slays the guy. And then this old hag comes out of the woods and basically says, you killed my husband. Now one of you has to be my husband because I'm going to die without you. And basically uh the the one who killed him said peace out i'm gone you know whatever he's like i'm, I'm done I ain't, i'm out of here and um he gets cursed and it's a whole thing but that, other than that <laughs> the 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 one who stays unbelievably disgustedly reluctantly agrees and they have the absolute most uh horrendous natural wedding if you know what i'm saying um and because law of nature this is out in the woods somewhere um (laughs) and uh he just you know is completely disgusted and 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 vomitous by the experience like just really really bad and he wakes up the next morning after having passed out just from pure disgust um and he wakes up next to the most beautiful woman who has ever existed Hmm. and he's like where'd the old hag go she's like you have redeemed me, hmm. right? You have stepped in where another had caused the problem. You, you, uh, so, so, and, and the crazy thing is, this is all pre-Christ, but we totally have mm-hmm. Adam and Jesus, hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not yeah. perfect, of course, but we totally yeah. have that. We totally have the idea of, the one who messed it all up the brother and then the brother who stayed and redeemed yeah right and 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 that idea is just crazy to me and there's a whole bunch more stories with them because they end up you know ruling this kingdom and (laughs) whatever else but like that's such a crazy idea to me and i don't want to do a gender swap version but i want to add some kind of element of that story i really want to just lean hard into not just not what's on the cover of the book is what's inside blah 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 but really delve into what true ugliness is yeah and what true beauty really is and how the inner beauty comes out and the outer uh wretchedness goes in you know um and and how these how these things work you know and and stuff like that so yeah anyway uh, i i just i wanted to throw that to you because of you asking for thoughts on beauty and the beast yeah (laughs) yeah um, it is one of my favorite fairy tales overall yeah and of course i mean growing up with uh, the original disney version is one of the it's like it is a a really stunning film Mm -hmm. and yeah i rewatched it recently and it's like wow that's good um, yeah i have um I, I did another beauty and the beast retelling all already mm-hmm. which uh, released in an anthology last year which was a little bit more traditional 
Mm -hmm. like the uh, classic French version. Mm -hmm. And I have another one planned because that is a story that has so much depth mm -hmm. and so many different angles that you can go into. But I like, yeah, the heart of it, uh, of exploring what true beauty is, like you were saying. Yeah. What makes somebody monstrous and right. ugly. Yeah, right. not just not just ugly, but monstrous. And the tragedy of monstrousness. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. Like the curse. The curse is a huge tragedy. And yep. one of my theories um, as a fairy tale teller mm -hmm. is that curses always curse more than just the person who's cursed. Yeah. They always affect everybody around them and everything around them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with Sleeping Beauty, it's not just her who falls into an endless sleep. It's also her whole kingdom and they get oppressed by thorns and briars. Mm. And it's fascinating how that affects everything. Yeah. So with the, um, you know, with, with Beauty and the Beast, you can, you know, classic style, you see how his beastliness makes the rest of his people beastly. And, Disney's done, oh yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, which is just, it's an interesting exploration of that and i'm yeah i'm still trying to figure out how i want to explore that for my own story yeah but... disney has done this one time where they did it right exactly <laughs> what you're talking about and a lot of people miss it entangled mm -hmm. where like okay so a lot of people talk about tearing up when they do the actual song i see the light a lot of people talk about tearing up when they see the dad tear up and yeah i'm a dad i get it but like um you know because he's he's just been gone for so long or she's been gone for so long and he tears up right before they're about to have this big ceremony and whatever and the mom's there with him and comforting him and but the thing that always 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 gets me is when i see thousands of peasants lifting up their lantern in hopes that they will one day see their princess again yeah that just blows my mind that is fealty to the you know yes. representative head family of this kingdom and, yeah. and and it's not just them it's their office it's everything that they represent yeah. for the people it's like like disney nailed it on that one yeah it's like she's more than just the um the celebrity right she's the what is it um until we have faces yes yes right yes. at the end there's the uh, priest writing the uh, the end note mm -hmm. and he says something like you know she was our shield yep and i love that concept mm -hmm. the um you know this is you know like royalty or well, um, the prince in a broad sense mm -hmm. as the shield protecting the people from harm and mm -hmm. leading the way. I love that concept. And yeah, and having the um, entangled where they're like, you know, she's gone. She's the heir. Yeah. There's nobody else. There's the king and the queen and they only have one daughter and she's gone. Yep. And someday, hopefully she'll come back exactly yeah yeah it's just just incredible um the let's see let's see the one other there was one other thing i really wanted to get into um let me see if i can remember got so off track there but i love it i love these add conversations that i tend <laughs> to have with people because there's just so much to say, you know yeah um especially with things like fairy tales and it's very obvious mm -hmm. that you're extremely passionate about it i am too i'm equally as passionate about um more traditional fantasy and sci-fi and superheroes and whatever else so i'm all over the place but like fairy Just tales get me man, started and i can go on about superheroes and... there you go <laughs> but uh <laughs> but yeah like i think oh i remember now so especially after listening to some folks like joseph campbell you know hero with a thousand faces 
um that sort of a thing i don't know if you've ever read that book but i'm sure you've heard of it hero's yeah. journey you know etc a lot of writers do i get it mixed um, up with the other campbell but um yeah i know who yeah. he is yes yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um listening to some audio from him because there's some stuff on audible that's like old interviews with him and whatever and it's very possible actually that he became at least you know uh, a catholic christian uh before he passed away um he 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 at least had a a leading back to the catholic church um which was interesting uh, a lot of people don't know about it but he was a sort of universalist um, um he he is sort of like jordan peterson was slash is now you know he has oh. this this sort of like you know idea that there's these platonic forms they exist you know and they 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 repeat throughout history and blah 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 and you know hebrews in the bible has something to say about types and shadows just saying <laughs> this has a lot of stuff to say about types and shadows so my belief is that the whole idea of the hero's journey the idea of these repeating forms and stuff that we see in places that may or may not have had any actual contact over the centuries but yet they have the same stories and all these mm -hmm. other sorts of things you can really actually tie that back to the oral traditions of the word of God. Um, and one of the biggest ways that I like to show that to people is one of the absolute most ubiquitous fairy tales across all cultures. And that is Cinderella. Hmm, yeah. Cinderella exists in every culture, mm -hmm. like as far back as we can check. Yeah. It, you know, there's, there's versions that we know when they came out, but the story itself has lasted way before that. Mm -hmm. I have a theory particularly about Cinderella and I'm not saying that this thoroughly proves my big broad theory but it gives it's my best uh uh up, it's my first argument <laughs> my first volley you know um and that is that Cinderella is Ruth hmm you got a yeah. we got a redeemer character we've got uh the situation with a mother-in-law character there's good in one and bad in the other but there's other versions where she's good yeah. you know whatever we have intervention via angels godmother that sort of a thing uh we have um other family intrigue who's gonna marry you know all that other kind of stuff there's versions of it that have more of that than the french version and here's the thing that really clinches it we even have some weird connection to a foot thing <laughs> we have we have the yeah. slipper and then we have her slaying at his feet yeah right and so like there's so 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 many things that connect ruth to cinderella it's like yeah i, I mean she's literally in the line of jesus this story would have gone everywhere you know yeah and we don't know who wrote the book of ruth really so it's like <laughs> yeah some royal official in david's court i always thought yeah, either that or, you know, Solomon or someone in that whole mm -hmm. situation, because like, I don't know if you know this, but the the earliest manuscripts we have there, there's a different sequence of books than mm -hmm. the sequence that we get in either the Protestant Bible or the Catholic Bible. Um, and the one of the biggest one of the biggest reasons for that is organizing books according to their genre because we're obsessed thinking that we can make it somehow better by organizing it in some gnostic way as opposed to a narrative way but um <laughs> the uh the book that comes after proverbs proverbs ends with the proverbs 31 woman the book that comes after proverbs is ruth interesting cool yeah so, so. it's like here is the ideal woman and here's an example exactly yeah <laughs> so that's that's just another thing about that but yeah i just i have i have so much where i'm tying the themes of scripture into the fairy tales that i write yeah. um and obviously we're christians that's what we do but like <laughs> yeah uh, even more than that there's certain like thumbelina what i'm doing now with her um the whole idea of uh being small obviously is a huge thing you know in scripture like one person against the world um mm. being kind of thrown into crazy political situations and expected to deal with it like esther um and then uh one of the biggest things though for me is um i don't want to spoil anything in particular but the the the, the basically the idea uh have you seen the don bluth film or no 
Of what? Thumbelina. Of oh, Thumbelina. No, I haven't. Okay. Um, Where'd it go? It, it's good. There it is. Um, it's good. It's not great. It has a lot yeah. of flaws, you know, whatever. But... I've seen art. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's Don yeah. Bluth. He's, he's fantastic. At mm-hmm. what he does. You know, Land Before Time and, and, uh, and, and uh, American Tale and all those, all those films. But um, the, uh, the, my favorite part of that movie, not really a spoiler because it's been out since like 94 or something. Um, they, she believes because she's been told by a lot of people and seen some evidence that her prince is frozen solid and dead. Hmm. And he was frozen and solid and dead because he was looking for her. She got lost. Well, there's this overly optimistic, ridiculous French swallow that's annoying as all get out in their version. But anyway, he's her, he's her buddy friend and he, flies in and tells her no 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 he's alive he's alive he's alive right and he's like she's like we gotta face facts like he's he's gone what what are you doing this make like stop rubbing my face in it (laughs) and he takes her out to this this place and it was the place that she was supposed to meet him like a while ago weeks ago and she the 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 swallow starts saying like say telling her to sing because he'll hear her and he'll come and he has her singing the love theme that they had between each other. They had their little, you know, magic love moment. And he's like trying to get her to sing. And he's like singing parts. And he's like, go ahead. Come on, <laughs> sing along. And and uh, she's just annoyed by it. And she starts singing. And she's like, oh, what the heck? I'll belt it out and show him, show him that he's wrong, you know, whatever. And this, 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 this says, let me be your wings. Let me lift you high above. Everything we're dreaming of will soon be ours anything that you desire, anything at all. Every day I'll take you higher. And she's just singing it and belting it. And it's Jodie Benson. It's Ariel, you know, she's, she's Mm -hmm. belting it. And then the last line, and I'll never let you fall. The prince comes in and belts it out and there's shining light behind him. And she runs into his arms and she then, you know, hugs, kisses him, immediately sprouts her fairy wings and they ride off together and it's one of the most glorious pictures of christ in the tomb um yeah you know what i'm saying the the prince the king returning to redeem you and make you what you were meant to be a fairy Mm. all along she was a fairy she she just didn't have her wings right Mm. all the time we were humans we were not just not just humans but walking in the garden with god humans yeah right yeah <laughs> and we got our wings you know what yeah. i'm saying like you see what i'm saying so like yeah. that's those are the two big things i'm trying to be emphasizing in my thumbelina so i love it that yeah. sounds cool yeah so anyway we can start wrapping up where can people find your stuff and if you want to stay on after i wrap things completely that's fine we can talk for a minute um but where can people find your stuff because i want people to be reading more fairy tales and i need to mm-hmm. give them places to look for them let's go yeah <laughs> <laughs> well you can find my book a time of morning and dancing on amazon and um i i come out with fairy tales in various places i um your other stuff too i'm interested in so yeah anthologies uh i just did a steampunk ninja frog prince (laughs) retelling love it yes yes that one's in the um the gunbate anthology that just came out it's Mm -hmm. inspired by they're all inspired by anime and manga even though I don't read anime and manga, but I do fairy tales. So, <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, that one was fun. So that one is, um, that one's available. And I have lots of stories on Havoc. Quite a few of them are retellings. Mm-hmm. And I have yet to do a Cinderella retelling that I love, mm-hmm. but it is one of my favorites. Lean into Ruth. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, That's what resonates. I love that idea. <laughs> that sounds, I, ha, I have a Ruth retelling. Oh, really? And it's not published yet, mm-hmm. but I love this idea of incorporating some Cinderella aspects. So it's a, um, it's a mermaid story. So mm. 
I'm going to, I think I'm going to polish that up with some Cinderella. Yeah. Elements added oh, that's in. That's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. That could be fun. So, I can tell you got the wheels turning after this oh, yeah. conversation. <laughs> it doesn't take much. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I, I, so. got, I, I definitely now have one thing to tell you after we finish, but okay. <laughs> we'll get to that. Anyway, um, everyone remember be your family's bard excuse me let's try that again be your family's bard <laughs> do not turn to the right or to the left i'm not editing this and the lord will be with you wherever you go <laughs> we'll see you next time in the trenches on poets at war god of song said the warrior bard though all the world betray the one sword at least i right shall guard one faithful heart shall free.